Okay, welcome to another episode. Okay, I believe last week we left off in Deuteronomy 23 somewhere, um, but I'm not positive about that. I think we've gone through a lot of that. So, 23.2. Okay, verse 2. Yes. Um, my plan today is to go back and catch a thing or two that I may have missed, and we'll probably... Quick, we'll probably start over in 23, but just fly through the parts that um, we already discussed that make sense. And then I want to get into some of the other um, the other holiness laws. Uh, we talked about this last time, but what is holiness? What is the idea of being holy? Set apart. Set apart. Set apart, set apart how? For purpose. In a good way? Sure. <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll go with either of those in a good way, in a purposeful way. Because there are a lot of things that are set apart, right? But you can be set apart as in, oh, you stink. This is the worst of the worst. That's not holiness. That's not the kind of set apart we're talking about. It's set apart in a good way. Things just stand out. You, um, you know, for guys, and usually with guys in really expensive cars, those cars are always set apart. You know, I remember the first time I saw around here a Viper driving around. <laughs> And I'm like, people drive those at this, whoa, you know. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, there's a Ferrari around here. And there's, yeah, a, there's a Lamborghini uh, I remember when I was younger, the Plymouth Prowler to me was so unique and expensive. And I saw one of those, I'm like, whoa. So I do remember growing up, too, um, we took a trip. Exactly, it was a trip. We were driving around, I think it was somewhere in Orlando, Kissimmee. It was just one of those normal neighborhoods. But this one guy down the street, regular looking house, he had left his garage door up for some reason. As we drove by, we saw his vehicles, two Rolls Royces. And dad was just going on, I hadn't even heard of that at the time, you know, but dad was just going on and like, this got two Rolls Royces. And you guys know why he was going on, right? Because <laughs> Rolls Royce is what? The price of a house, right? They're super expensive vehicles. So that- made. Well, that would be a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> Insanely expensive vehicles. So. Those vehicles were holy, in a sense. They were set apart to get your attention and, uh, because of what they were. So these commands God gave were to set Israel apart. How they dressed, how they ate, how they acted, what they did, what they didn't do. All kinds of things. Some of them make good sense to us. Others of them make kind of okay sense to us. And then there are some of them that were, we just got to be honest, I think, and we don't really know. Not really sure why. Um, he said to do that. God said to do that. You know, um, as parents, a lot of times you tell your kids certain things, but there are some things that you tell them that logically don't make a lot of sense if you think about it. There, there are a lot of good things as a parent you would say, right? Like what's an example of a good parental command that you were given growing up? What do as say? I say, not as I do. <laughs> Those kind of parents, huh? <laughs> All right. Someone in the young demographic here. What's a good thing? Don't put your finger in. Aha! Wonderful advice. Yeah. Light sockets and things of that nature. Yeah, that's a good example. Because I said so, just did anyway. All right. But there, oh, sweet. but there is another command, right? Um, uh, for example, have you ever told a kid not to scratch a chalkboard? Uh, yes. Uh, Why would you tell him not to do that? <coughs> Sounds horrible. Is he going to really ruin his fingernails? Or are you going to break the chalkboard? Let's be honest. No. You're not going to ruin your fingernails. You're not going to break the chalkboard. So why do you ask him not to do it? Well, for some reason, it just bothers you. You don't like that sound. And for my wife, and I guess for some other people, it's metal on metal. I can't cook with a fork in a metal pan. I'll just start scratching it. And I, you know, on the other side of the room, ah, stop it. I get yelled at for that. Why? Well, I don't know that there's a huge logical reason for it, but it's just kind of the way it is. Well, we have to wonder with God, too. He's, he is being the Heavenly Father that He is, and He gives these commands, but sometimes He opens up a clear explanation for us to understand why He told Israel that. And then in some other cases, it might take some more digging to get at it. And it, it's not promised that we will ever know for certain. <laughs> at least nowhere in the Bible I'm familiar with is it promised that we will understand everything about God's commands in the Old Testament. 
and why the exact purpose was. Some of that could be kind of the mystery that we unravel the deeper we get into the faith, which is really cool. So God says that he is jealous. Um, he's a jealous God, right? In Exodus 20, after he mentioned the second commandment, no idols, right? Not in the form of anything. And again, no idols isn't so much talking about bowing down and worshiping a thing. What is the no idol command mainly talking about? Don't worship God. How? Through the idol. Through this thing. Don't create an object that you have to have in order to use to have access to God. You know, don't let God be represented or boiled down to any inanimate object. That's, you know, or thing like that, because he is so much more. Um, <clears throat> God says he's a jealous God, and he's the kind of jealous God that punishes the children, literally visits the iniquity of the fathers onto the children down to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. But he shows love to a thousand generations of those who love him. Now, last week we discussed this, but I want to make sure it's ingrained, it's important. First of all, third and fourth generation, what is that? Father, Not even great, two grades. Great, great, great. All that is is um, from the son all the way up to the great grandfather or vice versa. That's three generations is a grandfather to a grandson. Four generations is a great grandfather to a grandson, right? Two generations would be your dad to you. So is it true that bad things happen to everyone who's alive around you? Sometimes if you do something wrong or if you're involved in something wrong? Yeah. Sure. The consequences like that happen all the time. So does God allow the punishment to affect everyone around who's still alive? Maybe even to the third and fourth generation. Sure. If they sin, if they reject God, <coughs> they send their punishment and he warns them, it affects everyone. He does not hold them guilty if they're not guilty. That's important. You know, somebody might be experiencing their dad's consequences because their dad made a stupid decision. But that is not the same thing as them being guilty for what their dad did. They are not guilty for what their dad did. They are just suffering because of what their dad did, which is sad. But on the other side of this coin, God says he shows love to a thousand generations of those who love him. Now, I heard... And I don't know why I was flipping past this, but I heard Joel Osteen speak on this point. He had a wonderful sermon on this point because he didn't talk at all about the visiting the iniquity. He just skipped that part. And he went straight to the love on a thousand generations and he preached this whole sermon about that. Yeah, one-sided. Wonderful. So um, here's what I wanted to point out that I didn't point out last time. The word that God uses when he says he shows um, love to a thousand generations of those who love him. Um, does anyone have Exodus 20 pulled up already or is close by? I want to see what your version says in verse 6, I believe it is. The verse that says shows love to a thousand generations. Can you read that verse? Has anyone here just planted a vineyard? Is that like, Exodus 20? Oh, my bad. I have on Deuteronomy. Oh, okay. Uh, that will change things a little bit. <laughs> Exodus 26. Exodus 20, I think verse 6. Turn that out. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keeping my commands. Okay. Um, what version? ESV? Yes. Anyone have another version? To I have read? an old team What does it say? Uh, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Okay, interesting. There's a footnote that says thousand. A thousand. Okay, a lot. A lot. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my <coughs> commands. Okay, that's probably a little bit better. And the reason why is because there's two different words for love used in that verse. I didn't realize this. When I looked at it, God, it says, um, he shows love to a thousand generations of those who love him. Well, that word is... Oh, it's fun to say. Chesed. Chesed. That's the word for loving kindness is, is kind of the definition you hear for it. God shows chesed to the generation. Now, what is that? Well, that is, um, it's translated a bunch of different ways, but loving kindness, favor, goodwill, um, mercy, uh, good, wanting good for loyalty, 
all of this is kind of wrapped up in the idea of love. You, you know, Hebrew is not a language that's known for having a whole bunch of different words for different concepts, but in the area of love, it kind of is up there. There's a lot, and I'm not sure exactly how many because I don't know which one sh really should be defined as love, but there are a lot of different words that could mean love in certain contexts. So two different ones are used here. Loyalty, loving kindness, favor, mercy. Um, God uh, is loving, in this sense, to those who what? Ahav. Well, that is different. This word is used all over the Old Testament, and it is probably the standard generic uh, word for love that's used all over the place. Um, when Abraham was told to take his one and only son Isaac and sacrifice it, God said, take your one and only son Isaac, who you love, Ahav, who you love. Um, uh, Isaac... Uh, loved Rebecca. Uh -huh. uh, all throughout the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, the majority of the time, this is the word that you see. And so what does it mean? Well, it, it really means to desire, um, to, to crave, to, to want. Uh, gets a lot more, it seems like, emotion involved. And what, what's, what's also interesting about it is um, when I was reading up on this word, it comes from a root, at least one of the sources was saying that it comes from a root uh, about breathing, about your need to breathe. In other words, the idea is I breathe for you. I need you. You know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of love we're talking about. Like, oh, I breathe for that person. That's why I'm here. I, I just care so much about you. I can't, you know, I'm obsessed. But do you see the slight difference here? This is more of a feeling, yeah, they're act it's generic, you know, but feelings, actions, emotions, heart, everything's getting involved in this. I just, I love you so much, you know. God, on the other hand, is showing chesed, the um, loyalty, the faithfulness, the loving kindness, the goodwill, the intentional. Um, and isn't that cool? This is something that God does. Why would he use, does anyone have a thought? Why would God say, I will show this kind of love to all those who ahav me with this other kind of love? I'm going to see if I explain this right, if you can give me some sort of an answer. Why would you think God would say that? Why didn't he just use the same word twice or whatever? Because his love is a love from a father to a, to a child, and this love is just an all-consuming love that you would have for a person or a um, the person that should be the center of your life. Okay. Um, I do think you're on to something, but this is also used of the love of a father for a child. Like, oh. for instance, um, Abraham loved his son oh, I Isaac. I see. This kind of love. But I do think you're on the right track. Anyone else have a thought? I think she's on to something where it's like it, you, our life should kind of like revolve around that and like affect us in everything we do. But God doesn't necessarily need us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, he, you know, wants all these things for us, but he doesn't. It, like, our choice has no bearing on who he is. I really think you're spot on. It, the reason why, by and large, um, I think God would ask this of us instead of this, because depending on what sense you're using this term, um, we can't. We can't wish God goodwill. We can't wish him loyalty that benefits him. We can't, we can't do anything that helps God out. We're not in that position. We are far too inferior. It just, it just makes sense, right? So how can we show our loving kindness? toward? Well, there is that we can show that we love God, yes. But we cannot <coughs> show God any form of mercy. What, is God going to mess up and we're going to have to forgive him, you know? We can't show God any extra form of grace because that would imply we have to be in a superior position in order to do that, right? That's kind of how grace works. You have to have something that they don't have and give it to them. But we don't have that for God. So there's no real way we could fulfill that. But what do we have? Well, we have our affections, and we have our heart, and we have our thoughts, and everything that we are made of. And we can use that so we can obsess over God. And that's also tied up in this word, too. It's a very broad word. 
So God is looking for people to just love him, to obsess over him, to really care about him. And for a thousand generations, if this is the kind of people that you're going to be, God says, I'm going to be this kind of God to you. Not just one that, a lot of times we focus about God being crazy for you and loving you or whatever. Very feminine, in my opinion, or whatever. Um, you know, that, that this wonderful love story of God. But God's love is also right here. It is the, I have goodwill for you, and I've made up my mind to do good things for you. Um, what's that famous verse about, you know, I know the plans I have Jeremiah for you. Jeremiah 29 11. Yeah, yeah. Plans to prosper you, plans to, that sounds a lot like chesed to me. You know, just, this is deliberate. So it's kind of cool. God will deliberately do the right things for you to show you the love that you need. You may not always like it, but it is best for you. And in return, you just have to trust him, sort of like that child perspective, you know. In the New Testament, that's kind of carried on, right? Childlike faith. What yeah. Is, what is your um, particular comment on the feministic view of that word? Uh, all I mean, when I'm, all I mean is a lot of times, um, the uh, we want to think about God emotionally loving us, oh, okay. not deliberately, intentionally loving us, you know okay. what I mean? Yeah, and I I'm, I'm using this in a very, very broad way. I generally speaking have noticed from youth conferences that I've been at and things like that, one of the ways that they really like to appeal to people is through emotion because it's an intense week and they're trying to do everything in that week. And nothing wrong with that, by the way, mm -hmm. um, but it, you have to keep with it. You know, There has to be substance to it for sure. But this is popular in our culture. People love to think of God as just um, crying over them and loving them. And I believe God actually does mourn over people, you know, and, and stuff, which is cool. But he also has a deliberate, you know. And, I, and there is, when we're dealing with each other, um, I'm afraid sometimes we focus too much on the generic and the feel good, and we don't always focus enough on the will and on the actions. It's sort of like the person who says that, I know, but he loves me, you know. Yeah, but he's beating you. I know, but he loves me. Well, then why do you have a big black eye? Well, he, he said he's sorry. He said he'd never do it again. What do you call that? Is that love? Well, he may have a little bit of emotion, but is, does this person love you? No, he doesn't love you, because if he did love you, he wouldn't punch your eyes out. Right? Yep. Did anyone agree with that or no? <laughs> Please <laughs> agree with that. So. <laughs> yeah, anyway, because love is a matter of the will as well. So... Anyway, it's just really cool, and there's probably a lot more to study on the idea of love in the Old Testament, which is neat. So anyway, um, that's the kind of God he is. Goodwill for us, so that's great. Um, holiness commands. Deuteronomy chapter 23, the first verse we talked about. Uh, will somebody just go ahead and read the first two verses? We'll wrap those up real quick. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut. Is you know, that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one of illegitimate birth shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet with you. They did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired you against Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Okay, we'll stop there. Thank you. All right, first of all, we're talking about entering the assembly, right? No uh, emasculated person or illegitimate child is supposed to enter the assembly. So does that mean that they are less loved by God or less human or something like that. No, it doesn't mean that. All it means is they are not supposed to be in this particular area at the worship assemblies under the Old Covenant. And so we ask, well, why? We, don't, we realize it doesn't make you any worse than anyone else because if you're accidentally unclean, you weren't allowed to be in there either. But the question kind of remains, why is that? Well, we threw around numerous answers last time. Some of the answers, um, the suggestions are some people would do this particular act to themselves as an allegiance to an idol or to another god. And so God would make it very clear, no, um, 
<laughs> I don't want you to even hint at that kind of thing going on in this assembly. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Others would, um, well, obviously, they wouldn't be able to have children. And sometimes that was, that could have been the issue too, because God put such an emphasis on family, and he doesn't want people going against that or whatever. So that's another possibility. Truth of the matter is, we don't really know. There are just some speculations that you could have. But I really love Sunday's sermon, how it was pointed out when Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. And then you go back to Isaiah, the 56th chapter, I believe, and God himself says through the prophet, to the eunuchs that obey me, that love me, that care about me, I'm going to give them an even greater name. So it's almost as though, you know, God has a way of doing that. Whatever you um, lacked at one time, God more than makes up for later on or at another time, which is really, really cool. In the case of Israel, it, it, it flipped over. They had it all in the beginning, but then they blew it, and they ended up losing it in the end. But there are a lot of people, like us, the Gentiles that were way back there, we lacked a lot in the beginning. We didn't have much. But then you come to the end, and God has more than made up for everything through the cross, which is really sweet. So God has a way of pulling these things together, which is cool. Um, illegitimate children, it may be every single child born out of wedlock, or possibility it could be those um, children of cult prostitution. Remember, a lot of idols and idol worship, foreign uh, gods, required prostitutes to be at the uh, a part of their worship. Yeah. And you wonder why it got so popular. Well, there you go. That's why. And so when children were born of that, um, it, it is sad, but it is so true. Like, why do people believe stupid stuff? Well, maybe a lot of them didn't even care that much, but they would get sucked into it anyway for other reasons. But the children of that could be all he's talking about. That no, we're going to draw a distinction here because this is supposed to be set apart. Why, why is it the children though? Because they had no, like they didn't do it wrong. Is it still because of the family emphasis? Probably. Okay. Because the same reason, remember, it, a lot of the eunuchs probably didn't do anything wrong either. Just like anyone who accidentally got unclean didn't do anything wrong. You accidentally okay. tripped over a dead animal, well, you're unclean. And, you know, you're going to be unclean till the next day or something. But that's not a sin. You just, you know. Yeah. And we'll get into more of that stuff, just to make it more interesting here. So, he also singled out a couple of nations, right? Um, what were those nations that he said? Moabites. And Moabites? Ammonites. And Ammonites. He said, none of those. Clear to the tenth generation. Now, remember, the number ten, when it's used in the Bible, what does it sometimes or many times mean complete. complete so what he's probably saying is never completely <laughs> no no Ammonite no Moabite ever is to enter the assembly that sounds pretty exclusive right so is God saying only certain races make the cut and others don't it may sound that way but do you know of anyone from one of those nations that was a true Israelite that was accepted. Mm. What about? Oh, yeah. Sorry. What? Yeah. Do you know? Ruth. What? Yeah. Ruth. Ruth, Ruth was a Moabitess. She was from Moab. Was she accepted into Israel? Well, yeah, I think so. The book got named after her. I mean, she's doing pretty good, right? Now, was there another person, a foreigner, that got you know accepted in? Um, well, Rahab. Right oh. at the beginning. Yeah. Was she an Ammonite? Yeah. I, I think so. Okay. I think so. You're right, she was a Canaanite. But the land of Canaan was filled up with all these different ites. Yes. And I mix them up all the time. <laughs> so, but there's two foreigners right there that are Israelites. So, what can we conclude? Remember, you got to take the whole Bible together. You can't just isolate something and cherry pick and think you've got it all figured out because that's not how it works. So what do we conclude? Well, I think the safest conclusion is if you do not accept the God of Israel and turn to obedience to him, then you will be excluded. And whether or not you're traveling through here, or you're just visiting or whatever, you are not supposed to ever enter the assembly ever because this is what you guys did. This is the history, and that is not, not okay. But 
if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to change. And that, that's kind of the beauty of it, too. A lot of times we think, man, that's not fair. God singled out this one nation or whatever. It sounds pretty mean, but then if you stop and realize anyone could become part of that nation if they were willing to change. And one of those changes was a baptism that they had to undergo. Um, but if they did that baptism and agreed to commit their life, they could be a proselyte and be part of uh, the Jewish nation. So God wasn't really being restrictive, but he was maintaining the standards. He's not going to just float it all over here for everyone. He's like, nope, this is the standard. Yeah, it's hard, but I'm holy, and if you want to be with me, this is what you got to do. So he made it available. But to these nations, he said no. Now, what does the what does verse seven and eight say? Because it's going to sound a little different, and we're going to have to speculate a bit more. You shall not detest an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not detest an Egyptian, because you are an alien in his land. The sons of the third generation who are born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. Isn't that strange? So the Edomites, um, what are the others? Egyptians. Egyptians. Did you mention a third one, or was it just Edomites and Egyptians? Those two. Okay, just those two. Um, did you read verse 8 as well? Yes. Verse 7 and verse 8. Huh? Yes. Okay, interesting. Um, why is it that these nations, after a few generations go by, they're okay with entering the assembly, and then the other two that we mentioned, never. Um, that's what we can kind of speculate. I don't know if we'll have a solid answer. Uh, one of the things that is pointed out is that the ones that are allowed to enter, they do practice on their own. They practice circumcision, which is curious, um, but that's something that matches up with one of God's commands to the Israelites, so that's interesting. Um, <coughs> What, what is also, I think, important to point out is even though it's sort of like that, that, that skit we used, you know, if you sit in the garage, does that make you a car? You know, if, if you go swimming in a lake or, you know, a fish, you know, just because you're there and you're around doesn't make you automatically, you know, just because you sit in church on Sunday, does that make you a member? No, there's a process, right? You know, just like if you sit next to a girl for a long time, that doesn't make you married to her. You know, there's, there's a process. Um, well, it's possible that some of the people of these nations, because they practiced circumcision and th they were traveling to and would be with the Israelites, that they might have associated themselves as Israelites and just thought that's who they were. You know, um, It's possible. But God is actually clarifying, if that's the case, he's clarifying and saying, no, nope, no, nope, there's got to be some time and a clear distinction that goes by because you have a history and that's another thing that's interesting. Why well, bring up the history? Well, Egypt was, were the ones that enslaved them. They enslaved them, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, God's pointing out a different side of it. It's like, yeah, they enslaved you, but before that and leading up through that, <clears throat> they fed you and let you multiply instead mm -hmm. of wiping you out. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would it have anything to do with Joseph and and his his the time he spent in Egypt and how he rose to yeah the position he was in because his brother was Edom. Yeah, um, I think you're right about that. <coughs> I think that's the good part of the history. And um, the Edomites would be um, Edom. Edom is Esau's descendants. Oh, so Esau. Jacob is Israel. So they are brothers. They are close kins, right? So for that reason, God says, hey, if you trace your history back, we come from an, you know, a unique family together, so you're not supposed to despise them. But yeah, they messed up, and so there needs to be a distinction. But once some time has gone by, third or fourth generation, then they're welcome in. It's just, it is interesting. I don't know that I can fully give you a solid answer on this. But it is curious. Uh, one of the things that I think is curious in my mind is the fact that God cares that they remember what happened historically. And I wonder if for nothing else could it be that God made these rulings just so people would be forced to remember their history a little bit. Because if you were, um, you know, if you were at the, the tabernacle to worship, later on it become the temple, you had to remember like, you know, oh, foreigner, wait, 
Ammonite Moabite, they're not supposed to be here, but oh, some time has gone by, they can. Um, there are a number of things that would teach you, but one is you have to remember your history and remember, okay, why is it again that we don't let them in? Oh, it's because of what happened way back in the past, and I guess we should never forget that because we might do it again, which yeah, that's what happens with history, right? If you forget about it, it repeats itself, and it happens again. <coughs> so God's very clear about remembering. Um, so I, I, I speculate that that's one of the reasons why. Where is it in the Bible that it tells you what the Moabites and the, um, I think the Moabites, they didn't let the uh, people go through their land. Was that part of the um, reason why God was mad at them? <laughs> yeah, but the, well, the big reason why God was mad has to do with a man named Balaam. Oh, that guy. his donkey. Oh. Not so much that, but your hand up. No. Okay. You're just patting your beautiful hair. I do that too sometimes. <laughs> um, but the advice that he gave later on was just send your girls out, intermarry with them, and then 24,000 people are now dead because God struck them with the plague. Okay. So, right. awful thing that they did, which is there's a very good reason why. No, nope, yeah. you know, okay. in the wilderness, no, that's not going to happen. Okay. Um, yeah. Doesn't Edom mean like red or something like that? Yeah. Esau. Like red, people either say that. Yeah. Esau. I, I, and I always get it confused because I think it both means red and hairy. I thought Esau is <laughs> Maybe you're right. Maybe Esau means hairy and Edom means red. So I assume he's a red and hairy. Red and hairy. We know he's hairy, but obviously <laughs> or, it's apparently he's red hair too. To a <laughs> I guess. What we say? Wasn't that hairy? It was pretty bad if they covered somebody with goat skin and they thought it was his son. <laughs> 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 but when you're an old person. Okay. Um, another thing that these things serve to realize, too, is that your ancestry is not the only thing. That, it doesn't guarantee you something. Just because, you know, you know, they are not all of Israel that are Israel. Just because you were born into physical Israel doesn't mean you're a part of spiritual Israel. Just because you are an Ammonite or a Moabite doesn't mean that therefore you know that you're going to live that way the rest of your life you can choose to become somebody different like Ruth did you know so historical roots don't so much matter if you're willing to change I think God's teaching us something there so um, let's see the uh, oh the prophets talk about this and th this is just some uh, references Isaiah 56 4 that's the reference to the eunuchs Right, so that's the one where the prophets foresaw that eunuchs will be accepted. Jeremiah forty nine six. That's about the Ammonites. The prophet Jeremiah foresees a time when Ammonites will be accepted, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Then in Jeremiah forty eight forty seven, Jeremiah sees a day in which the Moabites will be accepted. That's Jeremiah forty eight forty seven, and then finally in Amos nine eleven and following. He sees a day in which the Edomites will be accepted as well. So the prophets, after the law, foresee a day in which this is going to change and these nations are all going to be accepted. Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. God makes up the difference. So, um, okay. Yep. And, it, and Amos also makes the point that even Gentiles that are really remote, in remote locations all over the Old Testament time, um, they would come to Mount Zion and be part of the new Israel. And that's actually Isaiah 2.2. 2. Isaiah 2.2 2 and following, the prophet Isaiah foresees a time in which Gentiles from all over the place. Now, has that been fulfilled? Yes. Yeah. How do you know? Well, America wasn't here then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you know that it was fulfilled, though? Have Gentiles from all over the world come to Mount Zion? Yes. Yes. They're Christians. <laughs> Somebody read. Just This is a review that you always have to do every so often. Please read Hebrews 12, 22. Hebrews 12, 22. New Testament author of Hebrews, talking about Christians, says this. Whoever gets there, just read it. For you have come to Mount Zion and to the city, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, into the inner. Uh, oh, emer, emer, actually, I have no idea what the word is. Myriads. 
Aha, that one. Angels, lots and lots and lots. Yeah. yeah. Angels in fest in festival gathering. Okay, so it says you've come to Mount Zion to um, the inner sanctuary to these angels in joyful assembly. It's speaking to Christians when it says that. So you guys are Christians here. I'm speaking to you. How many of you have actually been to physical Mount Zion over there in the region of Canaan? Palestine. Anyone? <coughs> like three times. Right. <laughs> You're trying to cut back, huh? I've never been there. So how can the Bible say to Christians that have never even been there that you have come to Mount Zion? It's symbolized. It's a symbol. It's, yeah, it's Mount symbol. Zion is a picture of something else, right? Yeah. It is a picture of, well, what was Mount Zion back then? It was the peak on which the temple was located. It's yes. where God's kingdom was establish his presence on earth with mankind. Well, the New Testament says what? Where is the temple of God now? In us. In us. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? We individually and collectively. So God's presence has effectively uh, been moved into our lives, God's Spirit, with us. So you have come to Mount Zion. So anytime you read an Old Testament prophecy and it refers to Mount Zion or something to that effect, and all these nations coming together... You can turn on religious television and have them tell you that there's literally physically going to be random strangers from all over the world coming to this tiny little spot of land over there in, in the land of Israel, and we need to be, even pay money to help them do it. You know, that's what the Old Testament tells us. You can believe that if you want to. I thoroughly do not believe that. I think Hebrews 12, 22 is telling us all of us together as Christians, when we have come into the family of God, we have now joined everyone, joined the prophets, joined all of this culmination of things, and we are now in Mount Zion. We have come to Mount Zion. We have come to that kingdom. Hebrews 12, 22. There are other passages too, but it's talking about us. Yeah? Off subject, um, but relevant. Sure. The, uh, speaking of bringing people to Mount Zion, uh, the awards, the Academy Awards, and which I didn't watch, but... I read about it. They each of the, each of the nominees were given a gift bag, gift bag which valued about over two hundred thousand dollars. And the biggest gift was a free, all expenses paid, and the biggest hotels and everything to Israel, paid to, paid by the Israel Tourism Board. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Think about biggest it. gift, huh? Biggest gift. Yeah, it's it's it. $80, some people. Wow, a lot of people hold to a theology that says that all the Jews need to return um, to the region over there in order for the second coming to happen. If you're a movie star, get it for free. It's, okay, but there's a real problem with that when a lot of modern-day Jews are atheists. Do you realize that? A lot of them are atheists. Oh, yeah. We have converts. Uh-huh. Isn't that, I mean, didn't you see a problem with this? Especially when, when there's no other name under heaven whereby man much... With, must be saved, it's the name of Jesus, you know, I believe that's Acts 4.12. Well, if they're an atheist, they're not holding on to the name of Jesus, so I just don't see how that's going to work. I don't see how that theology works at all. You've got to take the whole Bible together. So, Anyway, we've come to Mount Zion, so we get to be part of those Gentile people that have been ushered into the kingdom. And the thing that's sad is that churches today a lot of times are ignoring the fact that we are part of the kingdom, this great thing that's going on that God is using to rock the entire world. We're the fulfillment of so many Old Testament prophecies, but we're looking for others. Oh yeah, it's going to happen. Somewhere over there in you know, the region of Israel, there's going to be, oh look, there's signs of the end times. I saw a battle, my stomach rumbled last week, there's signs of the end times. <laughs> you know, um, it's just sad because we're missing something great that God is doing right now. Yes, this, we are experiencing the signs of the end times because we are in the end times. And we have been for about 2,000 years now. That's what the last days are, about 2,000 years old. Um, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, in these last days God has spoken to us by his son. Jesus appeared quite a while back, right? So we've been in the last days for a long time. Um, okay, well... I think you guys understand some of this, so let's get into a little bit of the purity laws. First of all, I think this is on the first page of your paper, if you have that law sheet. You can check me out on that and see if you have the sheet that has the 613 commands. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have somebody go to Deuteronomy 22 in a bit, so you can probably just flip back there. It won't take long. 
But first of all, the food. You guys ate some good food. What were the restrictions for Israelites concerning food? Just give me the, the simple definition. You can't eat meat that's been boiled in his mother's milk. That's one of them. That's a specific <laughs> command, yeah. Anything unclean. What about anything unclean? You cannot eat anything unclean. So there is a distinction made between clean and unclean foods. Well, what is that distinction? Well, there's a whole section in Scripture that talks about it. And if you were, um, well, uh, it was things like sheep and goats and cattle and things with fish that had fins and scales. Those were the things that were allowed to be eaten, the meats that were allowed to be consumed, right? The others were not. Now, um, one of the things that I read, and if you guys know more about fish than I do, maybe you can verify this. Uh, I read that all poisonous fish have no scales. Not too much true. All poisonous fish. What about a bull dolphin? Lion fish have scales. They have scales. Okay. So I don't know if they, somebody just spit that out or what. So I don't know. I'll have to look into that and see if. And sometimes these commentators just say things, and I'm like, <laughs> your source on that. So I don't know. I don't know. But. For whatever reason, the, the restriction was fish with fins and scales um, was the, were the ones that they were allowed to eat. The others they weren't supposed to. And the way that God explained the law was, do you remember what the, what the law was? Anything that has what? Do you remember this? A creature that has a split hoof. Can you do that? Anything that has a split hoof and at the same time does what? Choose its cut. Split hoof, choose the cut. Yeah, choose the cut like cows. They got those multiple stomachs and they start to back up, yeah. chew the cut on that some more, get some more nutrients out of it. Well, um, God distinguishes that way. Anything with split hoof that chews the cud, that's what will be defined as clean for you. But can you think of any examples where the idea of clean and unclean was used before Moses? Let's go way back. Oh, yeah. What? Uh, tree or. Stuff. Tree of stuff and whatever. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, what? The, the, okay, did you say apple or in the beginning? It was a little after that. I don't know Noah. the clean and unclean distinction. Yeah, what about Noah? He takes clean and unclean animals into the ark. God says, I want you to take, you know, a pair of unclean and then seven of pairs, you know, seven of the clean animals into the ark. He draws a distinction. So there was some thing going on way back when. Did God divinely tell him ahead of time? Was it just a natural thing? Was it something that Noah just kind of intuitively understood? Um, not really sure. But it's mentioned before these food laws were ever given. There was a concept of clean and unclean. So um, there's that law. Um, what else? There's another rule about eating. You cannot eat anything that still has what inside of it? Any meat. That has blood. Blood. The lifeblood still inside of it. Now, a lot of pagan religions did that. Some of them would drink blood, and they have blood recipes, you know, blood this, blood that. It was a big part of their life. But God said, no, do not eat it. Now, there are some religious groups, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses have taken this pretty far a lot of times because um, on the basis of this, they say, what's not allowed to happen? Anyone know? No you, blood transfusion. You can never have a blood transfusion, right? Because the life of every creature is in the blood. I just think it's important to point out that transfusing blood is not eating blood. There's a totally different track there. I know because so my track gets pretty hungry a lot. You know, I'm not eating blood, but I've got a lot in me, right? And you do too. So it's it's. I don't believe you're violating that command at all. As a matter of fact, you're doing something to save life. So I think there's a big problem when you object to it and risk somebody dying because you're saying that's eating blood. I, I think that's wrong. Um, but God said, don't eat animals with lifeblood still in them. So you got to cook, you got to drain the blood. Now, I'm not a big steak person, but it's been pointed out to me that a rare steak, a juicy rare steak. Yes. Have, has anyone in here <laughs> eaten a juicy rare steak? Progress. Sinners. Eggs. Yeah. Sinners. Yeah. Didn't you read the Bible? Don't eat meat with lifeblood still in it. Don't call unclean what I say. That's not blood. 
Yeah. Juicy rare steak is not blood. They drain the blood ahead of time. You don't have blood in your juicy steak. Yeah. So. Uh, isn't it protein or something? <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> yeah. it is. It's, I used to know. You just know. I don't really? know what it's called. It's, not it's juicy steak. Blood, it's called plasma. <laughs> All right, yeah, well, anyway, so there's that. Um, oh, I didn't get into the fun conversation. All right, that's the food. Um, eating of fat. Now, this is something that is interesting that we don't think about. So, uh, the clean animals only, don't eat blood, no eating the fat of the clean animals. Or eating roadkill, you can throw that one in there too. You're not supposed to eat an animal that's, you find it dead. That's probably a pretty hygienic law, just to be safe, especially in those days, right? Um, but, did you realize that? I, you know, I don't even think about that much. They weren't supposed to be eating the fat. Is this a dietary what about law? bacon? They didn't eat bacon. No, that was a lovely animal. Oh. It was pigs. Ooh, terrible. They were supposed to trim the fat off and, um... Yeah, and not eat it. You remember one of the sins of Eli's sons, the priests? What they were doing, they would come up to the sacrifice of meat that was brought before the Lord, and they would say, you know, when they were getting rid of the fat, they said, no, give us some of that. Pull it out right now. We want to eat it the way it is. Oh. And that was one of the sins that God was, you know, got them in serious trouble for. My understanding was fat was actually considered, now, now I, I haven't brushed up with this in a while, so forgive me, but... Fat was considered one of the best. Like the choicest parts of this creature was the fat. So why would you not eat the there. fat? Because God deserves the best. They would cut it <laughs> off and they would burn it, sacrifice it to on, on the altar to God. Mm. That was their habit. The best part was given to God. Isn't that interesting? God the the tasty part, the right? The fat, which to me is like... Our really best part, in my opinion. So. Would have been well, fine by me, but you've been blessed. Why they leave it like on your better cuts of steak is because it provides a lot of the flavor. Mm. It's not tastes so good on its own, but but it it flavors the meat. Uh, That's why you gotta chew the fat. Yeah. Mm. Chew it up, chew. Huh? get that flavor out. Well, anyway, yeah. So they weren't supposed to eat fat too. You know, we see a lot of talk about clean and unclean, but I think we also need to hold, if you're going to hold to the food laws, you need to hold to the fat laws too. Don't you be eating the fat on that. Mm -hmm. Burn that to God. Don't you dare eat it. Uh, and Julie, you pointed out, no boiling a kid, baby goat, in its mother's milk. A lot of fun explanations for that. You guys know this, right? That one command about don't boil a baby goat. That's what a kid is, right? A baby goat in its mother's milk. They deducted from that that, oh, we shouldn't separate dairy products from the other products. And then in Jewish, Orthodox Jewish kitchens now, you have what? Two, two, kitchens. Kitchens. two complete separate kitchens. Where did that all come from? This one little command, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Woo, they went a long way with that one. A lot of hedges there. Um, but what does it mean? Well, um, what Doc Smith says about this. I'll quote him, is he says that the most recent and best explanation about that um, was that it's talking about the milk that the mother would uh, be letting out, secreting, after the first few days of birth, and that particular milk would contain blood in it, and so it would actually violate the command to um, not eat blood anyway, you shouldn't be consuming that. So that's what he's thinking, that maybe it wasn't a command for for the entire life, but it was a temporary command. Don't boil it in the milk for this short, you know, this particular milk that comes at a certain time, yeah? Uh, this might be irrelevant, but um, I was told by somebody that also there are health benefits that, like with this, like, to say if you were to boil, I think they said if you were to boil, um, meat and milk it loses all of its um it loses something that's important in the meat right. or yeah the nutrients i don't know if that's actually true when but you boil the crap out of any food it loses yeah that's i mean true. even vegetables like mm. you boil oh, the yeah, crap out of it and it loses yeah. nutrients. It's true yeah but it is interesting that you you know for all i know you're right <laughs> like, but it, it says don't boil it in its mother's <laughs> milk you know it doesn't say any milk 
So it still kind of makes you wonder, you know, what is up with that? Uh, okay, um, what about ritual purity? That you see a lot of on the first page there. And this is just fun to go through, not really. But let's boil it down to simplistic here. There are four major things that all kinds of purity commands are given out. I'm just going to write them down on the board. All right, these are the four major things that you'll see all these commands dealing with in the area of ritual purity. Death. Don't touch a dead body. Don't come in contact. If you do, oh yeah, what is ritual uncleanness or impurity? I guess I should have pointed that out. I think <coughs> is if you are ritually unclean, does that mean you have sinned? No. No. no, absolutely not. Otherwise, everyone's in big trouble. But if you were ritually unclean, you still had to separate yourself from the assembly. You couldn't go to the assembly meeting, and you had to bathe and clean up, clean yourself up. Sometimes you were unclean for a little while. Sometimes you were unclean for a long while. So definitely a lot of good hygiene associated. What about the embalmers? <laughs> they had to be unclean. Yeah. For a while, obviously. They the had people to. who made the awesome Burying their dead, boxes. they're going to be unclean for that. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're going to have to. So, <coughs> death is one. Another we've already discussed, blood. You come in contact with blood. And, um, hmm, this is just fun to talk about. <laughs> Women deal with something every month that involves blood. I'll leave it at that. That's going to cause uncleanness. Does that mean you're a sinner? Well, you're a woman, you're a sinner. But, <laughs> yeah, not your fault, it's just the way it is, but hey, that's one of the things that would make you unclean too. And in case that wasn't awkward enough, I'll just go ahead and write the other one. Why not? I love writing stuff like this on the board. All right? Basically, there are some long sections of scripture that you read, and hopefully you're reading it by yourself, and you didn't crack open a Bible with your newly, you know, not quite Christian yet friend and say, let's do a Bible study together. <laughs> All right, I just want to feel the spirit right now, okay? Let's, let's open up and start reading some of these passages that, uh, yeah, that make you... All right, so my, um, my story is, when I was young, we would read the Bible chapter a day, every night. Dad would read to the family, or whatever. And then there was one particular day where he opened up the daily Bible, or whichever one it was to read. He looked at it. He said, we're going to skip today's reading. I'm like, Dad, what is wrong with you? You don't skip the Bible. The Bible is God's word. You know, and I, I was suspicious. So as a result of that, I probably read it way too many times now because I was like, I wanted to know what he skipped. Why did he skip it? You know. So anyway, yeah, that's that whole section. Um, you'll read a lot of, it'll say, the, they'll use the term discharge. That's talking about anything that comes out, anything makes you unclean. Make sure I'm clean. And then the dreaded disease of the day. Yeah. What was the dreaded disease of the day? Leprosy. leprosy. Yeah. We call it leprosy, but it's not the equivalent of modern day leprosy. Um, commentators think it was something called scale disease. It's where you step on the scale and you're way overweight. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know what scale disease is. It's obviously so. So. <laughs> um, so you can look into that and see, but a specific kind. Yeah. What were you saying these four things cover? All those laws um, on page one, pretty much, there's a bunch of them about ritual purity. Uh, ritual purity, right here. These are the four major categories. All right, so how, how do we, um, and it's, it's kind of loose or whatever, but you're unclean if you touch dead body, all these things associated. Um, blood, contact with blood, flow of blood, you give birth to a child. Oh yeah, that's one, we need to mention that. Um, people get frustrated because when a woman at that time gives birth to a male, she's unclean for 40 days, right? Unclean, um, yeah. But if she gives birth to a female, she's unclean for 80 days. 80 days. Now that's just not fair, that's a little sexist, right? Well, interesting fact, before you think it is, remember, what was the big deal in those days? Family. And in particular, which was better to have, sorry, we're not in this day and age, which is better, having son. a guy or a son? son. I mean, a son. <laughs> yeah. a son. They're both good. But yeah, men wanted to have a son, carry on the line. 
if you had a daughter, that's okay, but it's not really the thing you wanted. So what would, what would potentially happen? Well, what would happen is if she did not produce a son, they would be in a very big hurry to get back to work so that we can produce a son. Because that's what you need to do for our family. So God has actually stepped in and said, hey, if she produces a son and you know, she's unclean for 40 days, but if she has a daughter, she is unclean for 80 days. In other words, you leave her alone, you give her time to recover, okay? Because you don't want to be bearing kids yourself. You would hate it, right? So God's actually doing mankind a favor, women a favor there. It's not sexist. It's actually the opposite, if that makes sense. Is that, is that clear? Because giving birth to a girl is a lot harder than giving birth to a boy. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's because they didn't you would give birth to a girl, and it's like, I didn't want that. Let's try again. And she's like, no, I need to recover. Oh, oh I you see. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. I think you do. So. All right. <laughs> we need to say more. Is that true? Um, that's my understanding. So then we have anything that comes out of you, anything would make you unclean, right? Remember the classic one, too? And this was even before Moses, but... Um, Rachel was sitting there on top of the household gods when her father, Laban, went searching. And she said, I would get up for you, Dad, but it's, it's, the, it's that time, you know. And he's like, okay, that's enough for me. Moving on, didn't search that spot there or whatever. Okay, anything like that. And then the idea of leprosy, you're going to read huge sections of scripture about bald spots. I have a spot on my head. Hmm. Who would you go to if you had a spot? You know, it's like this weird spot on my bald head, and it's whitish in color. Who would you have to go to? A priest. You'd have to go to the priests. They were the designated doctors at the time, and they would give you the okay. So God laid out a whole, a whole thing about whether or not you're unclean or not, and then whether or not you actually, you know, are quarantined or not, too. Cool. So, clothing. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Damn, I'm slow. Is that ritual prayer? Actually, that's, that's slow. slow. All right, let's pray, guys. God, thank you for being a holy God. Please help us to understand you better. And um, a lot of times I wish I knew more about you, but at the same time I love learning more about you constantly. And God, help us all to, um, to have a humble attitude and to not uh, learn one thing and then figure out, think that we know you because we've um, come up with some creative idea when maybe you want to teach us something even greater and even deeper about yourself. So thank you for doing that. Please help us to understand your heart better, especially as we uh, dig through some of these details that are, um, that are there and that you clearly want us to look into. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Apparently I was wrong about the lionfish. Oh, really? So wait a minute.